I thought everything was good, and then I realized the center is still 0.7 millimeters tall, which is way too tall. So we found a much better way to um, create the loom on the dial. So it's not going to be an OtterBox anymore. Yeah. It's actually going to be better. It's going to be American made and more American made. Yeah. It's awesome. Welcome back to Custer and Wolf. I'm RT. I'm Tyler. And today in this process of building a watch company, we're documenting all the work we did in the month of March. Thanks for being here. Thanks for following along. Um, we're going to dive in, but before we do, we just want to answer a question. We always try to answer one question from last week's or last month's episode. And the question that we keep getting, especially when Tyler wears the new cool hat, is where do I get the merch? Where do I get the hat and the t-shirt and all that kind of stuff? Um, we have a new product page on our website, vorticwatches.com slash merch is where you go to find this shirt, that hat, um, our new Colorado watch company, shirts and hats, all that good stuff vorticwatches.com slash merch check it out get yourself a hat or a shirt and um you know support us appreciate you diving in you have a dial on the table we don't have we don't have a whole lot of of things to play with today but we're talking about dials last uh, episode i think we left it off with you have to just dive into dials and just figure out how the heck you're going to make these dials so you've been mostly focused on the field watch dial i think we only have like you said earlier like the gct is a little easier we had one issue with the GCT dial, so maybe we start with that, and then we can go deep on the the field watch dial because we got a lot of really cool like video we can share. Sure, the GCT dials themselves are easier to make just because they're thicker. Yeah, the way that we're doing it right now uh, is we have a window machining fixture, and we machine both sides of the dial at once. Mm -hmm. That dial has tabs on it, and then we put it on a manual lathe on the Sherline lathe we used to make our. 3D printed cases on, and then we just clean up those tabs so the outside is perfectly round. Yep. So that's how we'll continue making the GCT dials. The field dials are quite a bit thinner, but we can go into that next. Um, the GCT dials, we have changed the loom scheme. So mm -hmm. we're putting loom at the four corners on both dials at 12, 6, 3, and 9. Yeah. Um, and it looks really good. We're hand applying the loom so we can make it thicker instead of pad printing it. Yep. It'll glow better. It looks really nice. It's going to come out really, really really good yeah. the gct dial the one issue we have is on the machined variant where it's not sandblasted before it gets dlc coded yeah the shiny option the shiny option yeah they are having issues coding the dials without sandblasting them yeah the first sample we sent early on looked great we didn't think twice about it yeah um, and now we're having a couple issues with getting that really smooth surface the, the coating to adhere to the really smooth surface. I just sent off a batch yesterday, another batch of dials for them to do some more testing with. So we'll have more definitive results after that. Yep. It's, uh, it's cool. Like the leaving the machine marks on the dial is cool, but if we can't get the black coating to adhere to it, then that's a whole different issue. So I guess we'll find out on the next episode. Cliffhanger number one. Um, how we uh, how are we able to solve and if we could solve the coding of the GCT dials and on the so on the field dial you've been going deep on just trying to figure out how to manufacture and and manufacture at scale and you have all kinds of new fixtures and all kinds of stuff like you're talking about let's talk about the um, a little bit more about the loom process and just you know manufacturing the like basically cutting those four quadrant slots um, instead of like right now you have like on this prototype I'm wearing, there's a little, little mountain, I forget what you call it, just a little mountain symbol on the top. And so we changed that back to a 12. And so now when you see the sample dials, they're going to have a 12, uh, numeral there, but the pad printer wasn't able to pad print the loom. Yeah. It's not that we can't, it's that we're doing it a better way. Yeah. 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 So we've found a much better way to, um, create the loom on the dial and we have these new slots at the four quadrants and it's it's a really cool process of how we're actually applying that loom yeah so we're actually milling pockets four pockets into each of the dials for the gct and for the field watches and they just get filled up with loom we found this tool kent found this tool called a stylograph it's 
basically just got really, really fine tips, like 0.1 millimeter tips that the loom pigment mm -hmm. goes goes inside the, uh, the stylograph. And then we have an air, I, I would call it an air pusher. I'm not sure what the exact word for it is, yeah. a pneumatic pusher. We used to use it for gluing watch crystals. Right. Um, and now this is what's feeding the loom through those tiny little tips. And you can just kind of go in and fill those little pockets by hand. The reason that we didn't go with pad printing, number one, and first and foremost, is uh, it doesn't glow very well. Yeah, it It's would. impossible to make it as thick as we can make it by hand. So when we were reviewing what, how we should do the loom and it came down to it, the process is super complicated, really, really complicated on the pad printing side, plus it's not going to glow as well. And that sounds like a bad equation to me. Yeah. Yep. So that's why we decided to change directions and add those four pockets so we could get awesome glow, make our process more streamlined and more repeatable. <clears throat> I mean, just looking at the the pictures and the video we have of of the, the four quadrants and, and how much loom is in there, I mean... To your point, it's just a, a better quality finished project and it's going to glow a lot more. So mm -hmm. um, so we'll have loom on the hands and then loom on the four quadrants. So you should always be able to tell what time it is at night. Yep. And speaking of pad printing, we got some really cool video of the pad printing process. Um, and Kent was trying to figure out basically how many coats to apply. And that was really a, a fun thing to for us to learn about as we're messing around with the pad printer and you know, do we do two coats, three coats, 10 coats? And the answer is on the lower side of that, because when, when he did like, I don't know if it was 10 or 12 coats, it was, it was a lot. And that's, um, I think to get back to the loom thing, if, if you tried to do that many coats to get it to glow a lot, it just doesn't look good anymore. The, the printing isn't as like crisp. Are you happy with, besides the loom process, are you happy with how the, the tech print, you know, is, is working out and, and functioning? Yep, we're pretty much just waiting to have finished dials to print on. We've already made finished GCT employee watches. Mm -hmm. So um, on the GC dial, GCT dials, since the machining part is not an issue, we've got them pretty much all figured out. We've got the pad printing for the field dials figured out as well. Like I said, we just we need the finished dials. Um, we bought an e-coating machine mm -hmm. and we just got all the supplies um, we ordered custom paint and everything from the company that did our samples. So we will be working on that over the next couple of weeks too. But the first batches will just be metal. Yep. The next major step is putting together the, the kits to send down to Arizona to FTS for, for final assembly. Update on that, they're, they're assembling the, the movements now. So they'll have the movements ready to put in the watches. Um, which is super exciting. We always, you know, little concern for not having control over that process, but it sounds like they're ahead of the game and they're they're ready for us to send kits, which is super exciting. Besides finishing the dial, is there anything else you need to finish in order to, you know, send the first batch down to, down to Arizona? It's just dials. We've got all the parts ready to go. Um, we made custom foam. We've got these big trays. We put cases, dials, case backs, bezels. Basically, we have the same amount Say we're sending 20 watches, we have 20 of each part. The maximum we'd put in like one box is 20 each because that's how it worked out besides right. the box. But the first batch will be somewhere between 15 and 20 watches uh, going off to FTS here in the next week or two. Yep. Um, and that will be hopefully 15 or 20 totally finished, ready to ship watches um, for Kickstarter customers. And I think last time when we talked about making the cases, we were just talking about how long it, it takes to make a case and you, you and I have talked about different machines we can get and all that kind of stuff. But the way you have it set up to make cases now is all on that tombstone. Um, do you want to talk about the just the process of setting up that tombstone and why it's, it's you know, more efficient to do it that way so we can show, you know, what that looks like? Sure. I, one more thing on, on the dials. The field dials, um, the big issue that we've been having and that I've been working on for the last couple of weeks is the thickness of the dial. Oh, yeah. yeah. To give you context, the GCT dial is about 1.8 millimeters thick, mm -hmm. and the field dial is supposed to be 0.4 millimeters thick. <laughs> yep, that's um, thin. <laughs> so the the proto the first prototypes that we sent to FTS were supposed to be 0.55 millimeters thick. Yep. And I made a big mistake. I didn't measure the entire dial. I was just measuring the edge. Right. And the edge was good, but the center was still 0.7 tall. Mm -hmm. And then it, 
hard to explain exactly why this happened. It's it's kind of in the weeds explanation. But um, then when we went to make the dial to the final thickness, I was trying to make my life easier on the prototypes to make it a little thicker. When I was going to final thickness, um, we got it, and I thought everything was good. And then I realized the center is still 0.7 millimeters tall. Yep. Which is way too tall. Yep. It's, it just basically hits the bottom of the hour hand, if yep. you can imagine that. The way we're doing it right now is we're machining both sides at once, like I was saying. And because it's so thin, at 0.4 millimeters thick, I mean, in the center of that fixture, it's you can just wiggle it like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's like flimsy. A, it's like a thick piece of paper, you know, this right. piece of aluminum. It's, it's flimsy. So I have to be really gentle. It takes longer. Um, and once I took that center area down to 0.4 millimeters, all of a sudden it started cutting through the dial and it was right. just a huge mess. So that was a big deal. Yep. <laughs> kind of had to, to reinvent the whole, the whole process to figure out how, how we're going to make it work, um, to get that final thickness. We even, I even went as far as asked FTS if we can get some taller cannon pinions. Yeah. And if we're going to change the design at this point of the game, just because this was such a big issue. I made a really rough version of a, a vacuum fixture. Mm -hmm. So you put O-rings on there, the dial goes flat onto the fixture, and then we use a Venturi that creates suction and pulls the dial down onto the fixture. So now we're blanking the dials on the DMU the same way we were before, but we're machining them thicker. Yep. And then they go into an OP2 on the mini mill, and yep. they get just get the top finished. So the dial gets sucked down by vacuum, and then the top is finished. And that allows us to create a super flat, very consistent, very thin dial. Yep. And once we go to increase production, you know, make it more efficient. Right now we're we're blanking them on the DMU one at a time. A human has to load each one of those to make a blank. It's kind of wasteful of material and it takes a long time. It's like 30 minutes or something. Yep. Um, we're going to transfer that part to the lathe. So the lathe will make the blanks and then the mini mill will finish. And that will be like a 20 minute total process versus 50 minutes and not even working. Cool. Yeah. So, and, and that's really, those are the things I, I, I forget if it was the last episode or a couple episodes ago, we talked about that, that quote that we heard of, of Elon trying to say like in Tesla making one and then making a thousand is a totally different Yeah, process. one's easy. For pretty much anything, <laughs> one's easy. We figured out how to make one, you know, but now we're trying to make, I mean, you know, 50 to 100 at a time so we can ship right. it. Right. Each, each step, I'm thinking to myself, can we definitely do this a thousand times in a row consistently? Right. Yeah. Or like, yeah, just down to the sandblasting. Like, yeah. can I expect a person to do this a hundred times in a row mm -hmm. to use this fixture in this way? Like all of it's... It's not like the Artisan series or a lot of the other stuff that we've done. It's like, if you get that watch over the finish line, perfect. Yeah. Um, these, everything has to be perfect before the first one mm -hmm. goes out. Yep. And then somebody's going to fall in love with that first one and we need to make a bunch more because we're going to need them to sell. So, um, yeah, that's, it's exciting and, and frustrating at the same time. <laughs> yep. And we decided to make two watches. So it's twice as exciting yep. and fun. Yep. So, so back to that on the field watch, um, you're making the field watch cases right now on that tombstone fixture. We were making what, you know, like the way you said before, uh, just one at a time, but now we can make five cases at a time. So, um, how'd you set up that, that tombstone and how does that work in the five axis? Yeah. So a, a watch case is two operations, basically no matter how you do it. Yep. Um, on a three axis, it's five operations. That's how we do it on the VM for the Vortec yep. watch cases. Um, on the DMU, we take four of those ops and wrap them into one, and then we have an op two. So you're machining the whole top, everything the you whole can see top, from the top. The case tube, the holes, yep. everything that you can see looking down from the top, and exactly. even some things you can't see from looking down from the top. Yep. All the stuff on the sides, all that kind of stuff. It's and almost you, finished after op one. Yep. And then you take that off, flip it over, and mill out from the inside and thread the back. Yep. And so that op two is all three axis and there's not much as, as long as the thread fits, right. there's not any super tight tolerance numbers that we're measuring. Um, so the mini mill is actually doing a great job finishing those cases. So the, we're, we've been looking at a, a fully automated machine to purchase kind of in the next six to 12 months. But, um, the way that we're doing it right now is we have, a tombstone, which is basically a block that just has five different parts on it, four sides and a top. And that 
we'll run five op ones at a time at night when we're not here nights and weekends yeah so basically we and that the op one takes roughly two to two and a half hours mm -hmm. and then the op two takes 30 minutes so we do those op ones at night and and on the weekends and that it takes about 11 and a half hours yeah it takes about 11 and a half hours to run that full tombstone so you can do the math yep. divided by five a couple hours a piece yeah so then we take all those op ones that we've built up at night and on the weekends and we run op twos one at a time so we can have everything located and perfect for that for the op twos and we just run those during the day since they're quick they're harder to automate you know plus they're faster so we'd only be running for two and a half hours at night if yep. we did op twos so we run case op ones at night five at a time takes all night and then we run op twos during the day and then on the dmu the DMU is working on case backs, bezels, and dials while the mini mill is doing op twos during the day. Yep. And then you got the ST pumping out buckles right now, which is exciting. Yep. The ST is currently pumping out buckles. Next up will be dial blanks, like I was talking about. Yep. And then after that, we'll be doing case backs. And all of those parts come together to make those kits that we're sending down to Arizona to be assembled with the movements and have, have those final watches. And like you said, hopefully we'll have that first batch sent off to FTS in the next couple of weeks. Um, right now it's the first week of April when we're filming this. And so our goal is to have those back, that first batch, which is a couple dozen at most watches um, here in the building and ready to ship to customers by the end of April. If everything goes perfectly, would you say? You know, if everything goes well, we'll have finished field watches in hand before the end of April. Yep, a few, you know, um, we had, I mean, almost 150 ordered on, on Kickstarter. And so on Kickstarter, we said we we're gonna be shipping watches. We hoped to be shipping watches in April and May. I think it's realistic to say we might ship a couple watches in April, but it's much more likely that we're gonna be starting to ship field watches in May. And so would you say we're probably about a month behind where we thought we would be? Yeah, I think that's okay. an accurate Last statement. Year. We're about one month behind where we wanted to be. Yeah. So knock on wood for us. Sorry, William. <laughs> he told me not to knock on the table. Um, and, you know, we will be shipping watches as soon as possible. All of that, though, is based on the field watch. So we talked about this um, before. We're going to try to focus all of our efforts because you can see there's a lot of moving parts, no pun intended, like there's literally a lot of parts that you're making. Um, and so we found it's best to just try to focus on one thing. So we're going to try to knock out the field watch, especially for FTS's sake when they're assembling. Let's, let's get field watches done from start to finish, get them back here, start shipping them, and then roll in the GCT watches, those military inspired, uh, the other watch, the GCT watch and start making those and shipping those down in like the second or third batch, um, and, and do those next. So the field watches are about a month behind schedule. The GCT watches could catch up, but we'll just let you know as soon as we're, you know, shipping those. Um, and hopefully we'll have more information on that in the next episode in May. We'll keep you posted. Um, the only other thing I want to say is that we were about, I would say, halfway through, maybe two thirds of the way through all of all of the backers. So you, you've at least two thirds of you have gotten an email from me, um, just confirming the options that you want. You know, which dial are you looking for? Which straps are coming with your watch? All that kind of stuff. Um, if you haven't seen that, go check, you know, check your email, check your spam. It's coming from info at coloradowatchcompany.com. And if you haven't seen that. Um, you know, I'm hoping to get through all the rest. I mean, there's, there's over 300 people or over 300 watches now. So we're uh, catching up as best we can, just verifying this is exactly what you're, you're ordering. And next phase and what the team has already started on is the, the, the box or the, all the box and the paperwork and all the other stuff that comes with the watch. Um, so hopefully we'll have a little more information on the box and um, what that's going to look like uh, in the next episode. So, yes, it's not going to be an otter box anymore. Yeah, it's actually going to be better. It's going to be American made and more American made. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's super cool. So oh, it's going to be all American made. Well, a hundred percent more American made. Yeah, because it's actually American made. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll let you know where we're getting that. 
Um, and we had to change a little bit about the box and how it's going to look and, and stuff like that. Um, but like Tyler said, it's, it's awesome. And, uh, and it's worth it because we found one that actually made in America. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so more info to come on the box in the next episode. And uh, yeah, between now and then, as always, um, subscribe here on YouTube so you get all of these updates. Um, you can subscribe to our email list at vortecwatches.com slash newsletter. And then if you have any questions, if you're a Kickstarter backer um, and you have any questions about anything we just said, um, shoot us an email, info at coloradowatchcompany.com, and we'll get right back to you. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.